So, I know that with a relationship with Christ, it's not always the easiest things. There's good days and bad days, right? Good days and bad days. And sometimes the bad days can speak louder than the good days. But what I'm hoping that in this relationship, the journey that you're with us on, that even in the bad days, you can pull closer to Jesus. You know, when I was a younger believer, and maybe you guys can relate, bad days kind of make you take a step back. You know, you just kind of just start darting backwards so you're at the back wall of the church, and then you disappear. They make jokes on statistics. Now, primarily people sit at the front, and as they move to the back row, there's body language there. Nothing against my brother in the back. He's just technical support. But uh, basically, when people start ducking out on you, they sit further away. And I think sometimes in troubled times, we do that with God, is all I'm saying. You sit where you want. But with God, we kind of pull back. But what's interesting is, when you're in a troubled time, you pray differently. Is that true? You pray differently. You pray for things. You have emotions. You have honesty. You're doing things in, the, in your mind and your heart. That you don't do when you're winning the game. You know, maybe you're just LeBron. I don't know what the score is, but maybe you're just winning. So you don't really care what prayer means to you. Maybe the rest are in your pocket. <clears throat> but for believers, inevitably, we don't want to lose that moment when there's a struggle. You don't want to just check out on God as something's like really grinding your mind. And you're like, what's, what's going on here? I'm asking this church to press in, to press in those moments because you get things you've never asked. You have prayers you would never fashion. And there are things in your heart that maybe have never been revealed to God, although God knows it, that need to be dealt with. Now, I'm not saying to go in there and start throwing your weight around with God. If there's a moment that happens, okay, life's going to go on. But I would, I would just suggest that as you do that, recognize that it doesn't win points, but God's willing to receive that from you just so he can connect. He's willing to receive you in any state. I, I know this because I have children. They come in all kinds of emotions. But you're still your child. You're still going to take care of them. You would rather they not, but you're still going to address the need. Is that fair? So, there's a prayer that many of us don't like to pray. I want to just kind of put that out there. Would you mind reading John chapter 15, verse 1 through 4 quickly? This is my opening topic, as always. You know me. I have something that kind of gets us rolling, and then we get to the sermon. Jesus is talking. He says, I am the true vine, and my Father is a vine dresser. It's very interesting. He gives up character of a relationship here. He is the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Did y'all just hear that? Who is he coming after? People doing good or people struggling? Well, you can say, okay, he throws away people that aren't doing well, but this is what sometimes people don't believe when you're doing well. How many branches? What's that word? Every? Who? Every branch. Every branch. Let me say every branch. Every, every, every branch, branch that bears fruit. That I hope that's you. Don't be ashamed. I hope that's you. He will prune. I want his pruning. Some of y'all probably used to pruning. If you're from India, I don't know if pruning is a word there. I have to ask my wife. But pruning is a very painful process. It's like losing that good shirt you have. It's like, man, I really like that shirt. I, I don't, but... Pruning seriously is a way of trimming and cutting otherwise good branches. Parts of your life God just kind of snips off so that it would bear more fruit. And the thing is, it's not just spiritual. You know in real life, this is a real thing. I was at a message one time of service, and a gentleman was sharing that farmers use a consultant that's very expensive, thousands of dollars. They fly him into these farms, and he is a professional pruner. And he said, these men will weep when he begins to prune, saying, what are you doing? Like, how dare you cut that away from this? This is my prize crop. You can't touch it. He'll just start cutting. Like, crazy. Like, what are you doing? And then he'll say, well, call me back in six months, and they'll have more. Mm -hmm. And believers are afraid. You know, we always like to give that, like, that arm. Well, we, well yeah, that's good. The, the fingernail. <laughs> I'm pruning this morning. I probably need to prune, too. But uh, we, we let it go to an instant, and then we, we throttle back. We're like, well, you know, that was close. So the thing is, friends, we don't want to be afraid to prune. And sometimes, I don't know how many of us have asked God, will you prune me? Why do we wait for God to do everything? If we're the adults or the leaders of the movement of God, then you can't be all asking, like, well, I'll wait on God to prune me. What if you said, God, I think there's something wrong. Let me give you this perspective. You all know the word plateau? 
spiritual plateau, wisdom plateaus, ministry plateaus, uh, laying your hands plateau, whatever plateau you hit. If you kind of hit just a stale point and you've been doing this, like, man, I, my gas pedal's not working and the clutch isn't doing anything, I'm still doing 30. It's like the cruise control is set on. And that's what I believe. Whether you're slow, fast, good, whatever you are, in whatever area you're talking about, if you don't see a change, that me a time that says it's time to prune. Is that fair? I hope you understood that. So I'm challenging you this morning to come to God and say, I'm not seeing changes in this area, this area, this area, or even my arm. Or worst case here. Paul says, I have been, start to the sea, crucified with Christ. How far did Paul go? And then he's become what? The greatest Christian there is, next to Jesus? Do you think that's an, an accident that he says, I have been crucified in Christ? I count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ? I count all things dumb in the pursuit of him? Do you think he's just making that up? No, friends. He got pruned all the way to here. So much so that he said, I don't care about that. I got nothing to lose. Now I'm not telling we should all become like martyrs for the faith unless God's asked you. I seriously doubt it. Many of you have actually received that call, but what I'm saying is, do you know what it means to be pruned that far? And so again, not a small thing, not an easy thing, but if you feel that there is a plateau in your, ministry, your walk, your, your relationship with Christ, your journey, I think it's time that you say, God, it's time to prune me. Wouldn't it be interesting if you're in the garden and one of the flowers started talking? Hey, get me. That's weird, right? But that's what God's saying. I thought about that as I opened this mess and I realized, you know what, that's always a hard deal. And so I hope that you guys would be willing to pray about that and I would challenge you please not to let that word get lost in this morning's message. So as always, I want to ask about last week, without notes in hand, I'm asking for honesty, what did we talk about? Family matters. Family matters. All right. Excellent. And multiple people answered. I just, that made me strong. Because <laughs> sometimes you just stare at me. I'm like, okay, what's the book after Acts? Korean crickets. <laughs> and then you're like, Romans. What's after Romans? Nothing happened. Like, first Corinthians. <laughs> Why did I say all that? See, to God, family matters. And there are, only ma there are certain matters that are only applicable to family. Sibling rivalry is not a term you use with your friends traditionally, or maybe a co-worker or your boss. Sibling rivalry, as my daughters are having, are, is a sibling <laughs> issue. And there are other details with siblings, like sharing shirts. You probably don't do that with a co-worker, maybe, weird. But, you know, kids, they can wear each other's clothes. It's Christy wears Sarah's clothes. Yes. <laughs> anyway, so my point is, there are just certain things that matter to families that don't matter to other people. So, what did I say? Paul, this man writes letters to whom? Churches? Mm, is it everybody in church that does the will of God and obeys? Who did Jesus call his family? Who are my brothers and sisters and mother? Those who hear the word of God and do it. obey it. Thank you, or do it. Same thing. So my point is, not everybody in church is doing that. Okay, now I'm not talking here, I'm talking about big church, big C. I'm saying, does everybody actually obey? No, then God is not talking to his entire family. God's talking to those who love him and obey him. So he's writing letters not to the city of Corinth, because you can't tell me the guys outside church have read Peter's letter, right? He hasn't read it. So he's just talking to a family. So the Bible is actually a book of letters to families. Cities of Corinth and Galatia and Ephesus and Thessalonica and Phil Philippia, Philippia, whatever. Close enough. So my point is, last week we introduced that message about the Corinthian letters. What was the major issue there? No? Division. Division, thank you. The men's group should know. We studied this in the men's group. We got the midweek reminder. So, division. And if anything, that's the opposite of? Unity. Unity, right. So, we read that in 1 Corinthians 3, there is no other foundation than Jesus. If we are the walls, remember, there are three terms. So the church of God is the same thing as the? Household. Household of God is the same thing as family of God. So we studied this at the end. The last semester was Jesus the foundation. We're the building. What goes inside? Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. I answer keys in the back. You guys, come on. 
So the Holy Spirit goes in. So on Pentecost, they were in one accord, one unity, one mindset, one speech, one judgment. And what happened? The Holy Ghost filled the building. I'm telling you, friends, if you ever decide to go into the role of ministry, you're going to ask God at some point, where's the book of Acts? It's right where he left it. It's the unity that has been thrown out the window. So it doesn't work the way it should. It's not about gifts being ceased. If you don't have the mindset that God gave his disciples, I know what you're expecting. So that was last week. Now, you know me. I'm usually one of those guys that crams a lot into one sermon because I found that it's just easier to finish a thought than to pick up next week and drop it off and start again and put a second point on it. I think you guys are mature enough to handle that. But lo and behold, after that sermon, I was given a dream where I met the Holy Spirit and he told me, we're not done. That was the beginning and we have to keep going. So God spoke and told me, literally, that's what he wants the church to understand. Now, you remember the history of that sermon? I said, I'm a guy that talks kingdom and anointing and ministry and all this stuff. But not very often I talk about character and the fruit of the Spirit and things like that. I'm not saying those aren't important. I just think those are things that you can read and study. But God had other plans, and I'm all for it. So what did I say? When Paul wrote about Corinthians first, I gave you an analogy. I won't quiz you on this one. A minister has five places to go. Visit his friend, graduation, new kid, a wedding, and somebody in the hospital. Where's he going to go first? Hospital. hospital. That's why he wrote Corinthians, because you know the Corinthians are not in good shape. They were having some pretty messed up sins. And he also called them children. So we're done with Corinth, sort of. So what's the next chapter? Not 2 Corinthians, but? Starts with a G. Galatians. Galatians. Let's go off to Galatians. Last week's message, Family Matters in Corinth. We are now in Family Matters in Galatia. Y'all ready? Family Matters in Galatia. Is that okay? Yes. Okay, good. Guys are looking very worried. I just I'm not saying you're Galatia, but we got some things to learn, right? I mean, we can't say that we're perfect. And uh, I want to encourage you, please, at the end of last week's message, even though there were some painful things to hear, I told you the revelation was if we can come to that unity of faith, the Holy Spirit would show up very strongly in you. Is that okay? Because you're the church. So I said you. It said a tongue of fire appeared on each one of them. I'm desiring that all of you receive a very mighty impartation of the Spirit. Trust me, at the end of this message, you will always hear something very revelatory, very strong, but we have to kind of get rolling. To get started, Galatians is only six chapters. So if by next week you haven't read Galatians, I don't know what to say. Is that okay? That's all I request. That if you can't read Galatians, it's six, it's really a short book. So if you've never read it, don't tell me you haven't read it. Just lie and tell me you read it because it's very small. It's a good read. Trust me, you'll be happier you read it than not reading it. It starts like this. First and second chapter, Galatians 1 and 2, Paul gives a history lesson of who he is. He begins to explain who he was, that God zapped him, and he became an apostle of God. In chapter 2, he says he met the other apostles. They gave him the right hand of fellowship, and off he went to go minister to Gentiles. And then in Galatians 3, he gets warmed up on the church. Now you say, why did he do that? I'm just fast forwarding so we can get to the verses. Why would he do that? How many of y'all read Revelations 1 through 3? What does Jesus do? He appears to John as the unveiled Jesus. Begins to say, I am actually the Alpha Omega. I was, was, and is, and is to come. I'm actually God. Now you see me. So he introduces John to the real Jesus in a sense. And then he begins to talk about seven families. So what did Paul just do? Thank you. Did I get that? Did you get it? I hope you did. One more time. Paul references himself in two chapters and then begins to address the family of Galatia. This is the same parallel that Jesus does in Revelations. He shows up in chapter 1 to John on that island called Patmos, and he begins to say, this is who I really am. Just as Paul begins to say, I'm really not Paul, I'm the apostle. I'm the one who leads this group. And then he begins to address the church. Is that okay? Got it? Good. Now we get started. Would you mind reading for me Galatians chapter 1, verse 6 through 8? Galatians 1, 6 through 8. We'll have it up on the screen as usual. It says this, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you 
and want to pervert the gospel of Jesus of Christ. Verse 8, but even if we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. Now, that is not the most friendly introduction if I'm getting an email. Let me explain. Verse 1 through 5 is Paul's introduction. Paul the Apostle to the saints that are in Galatia. Blessings, peace, honor, safety, these typical welcomes. And you know, oh, I got a letter from Paul. Pull the email up. Oh, hey, how you doing? I'm, I'm well. First sentence, I marvel that you are so soon turned away from the gospel. Now, what kind of verse is that? I want to remind you again, the order of Scripture in the New Testament books is no accident. He went from a hospital stay to a very unique situation in this house. Is that okay? So you wouldn't say, okay, you ever called your kid? When you call your kids when there's a bad day, you won't say, hey, how was Jim? You're going to say, I heard you got in an accident or a fight. Does that make sense? The only reason you would ever call your mom or your brother or your dad or your son or your daughter is to start laying into the phone. You know you don't have time for niceties. Does that make sense? So even though you can't hear his voice, the context is clear. There is an urgent, urgent problem. So, I'm not yelling at you all. Does it make sense now? So go back to verse 6. I want you to see context. Because without context, it's like a text from your friend. You, you can get into a fight just because you missed a context. I marvel that you're turning. It means, what happened? I told you to make a left on West Timer. What are you doing in Baytown? That kind of conversation. People on the internet be like, what did you say? So, I marvel that you're turning away so soon. So the real question is, friends, what happened? What's the big problem here? And how do we get this solved, right? If someone starts screaming on the phone, you go, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, hey, calm down. What happened? Like, what did I do? And uh, when you're married, I'm joking. <laughs> and uh, so he begins to say something. Now look at this. A different gospel, verse 7, please. Go back to verse 7. You can put the two up on screen. Which is not a another. Evidently, and this is across the board, not just back then, but you know it well today. They have adopted a new way of pursuing Jesus. Gospel, if you want to call it that. And he says, how did you get so far off the road so soon? Does that make sense? This is the problem. Now, what was the theme of last week's message? The other family he just finished the letter to, in a sense, as Bible order was put it. What did he just say? What was the problem? Division, right? No unity. Do you think this is important to God? Do you think division and unity is important to God? How important is it? Would you mind putting verse 8? How important is it that we are all of one mind? Let it be a curse. Actually, verse 9 says, I say now again, if you do this, basically go to hell. That's how far God takes you twisting scripture and using it for the wrong reason. He doesn't like it. Not that it's the issue of just making a mistake. Everybody makes mistakes, including me. My point is the idea of breaking the faith. Jesus went out of his way to create unity. Acts, remember, is the highest church you've ever going to read about. There's not really a church like Acts. And as much as I've studied, I don't know another church like Acts. And so my point is very clearly, what removed the Acts from the history of the church is unity, divisions. And so he said, guys, there is a reason we're falling apart. Do you mind turning me down? And because of that division, the church cannot stand. Remember what Jesus told the apostles? If a house is divided, it will fall. So if I have one gospel here, and I have another group that believes this, and another group believes that, how long will that church stand? It won't. So he's saying, how could this church so quickly fall from what happened? Is that fair? Now that's chapter 1, and then he begins to give the history of himself. So Galatians 1, 2, he begins to say, I'm actually Paul, I'm the apostle, I'm not writing you because I'm your friend, I'm writing you because something is terribly wrong. Is that okay? So let's roll to Galatians 3, you're going to see the same thing. Galatians chapter 3, 1 through 4. And then we're going to hammer into this. Foolish Galatians, now he's calling them fools. You know Jesus doesn't really care for that, but this is what the context is. He says, who has, what? Bewitched you that you should not obey the truth. But who, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. 
This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish that he uses it again? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? You know what's unique about those four verses? Put those four verses up for me. I want to see y'all catch it. Galatians 3. I want to help y'all study Scripture. What do you know that's very unique about these four verses? What's the main thing in common? They all end in what? Question. You've done that before. You picked up the phone and started asking them question after question after question after question. It's not necessarily rhetorical, but it's showing, like, it's not that you are here and this is where I was aiming for. You are here and I'm over here. You're far off. He's saying the same thing, like, what in the world did you do? How could you do that? I told you not to do that. When, why, why did you do that? You know what I'm saying? Like, it's multiple questions. So I want us to get to the root cause of this situation. Do you think this is still relevant today? Yes. Now, in this book, what was the actual, if I'm just reading this black and white, word for word for word, what did Galatia do? They went back to what? The law. Now, I don't think this church is today going back to animal sacrifice. And going, I mean, there are Judaism churches that believe in the law and haven't believed Jesus come. But across the board, I've been to a lot of denominations. That's not prevalent. But this is still relevant, is all I'm trying to say. This is still relevant. What is relevant? That's my question this morning. Okay? Why is this in the Bible? This is just a small point. What do we need to understand? What happened? And where could we be making this mistake today? Is that okay? That's why I want, to, I want to make this make sense. You can't just read, oh, I'm not in the law, so what? Okay, I'm not a problem. I think these questions are absolutely relevant. The first thing I want to make clear to you to understand, even with verse 6 back in Galatians 1, when he said, I marvel you so soon taken away. Was Paul around them physically? Was he around them? Yes. I'll prove that to you later. If it's hard for you, don't worry. I'm going to show you a scripture to prove it to you. So there's two questions again. At this moment, when he's writing Galatians, he's taking a pen, he's writing a letter, it's called an epistle, which means a letter. He's writing this church. Was he physically there? No. Was he there before? Yeah. I'll prove it to you, yes. He absolutely was. So what he's getting at is, when you're at home with your kids, they obey. But when the dads obey, the kids are at play. Is that okay? That's what just happened. He said, when I was with you, you began in the Spirit. But now you've gone back to old methods flesh. Now, I know we say law here, but I want to talk about this today as a church, as a whole church. I mean, capital C, the big church. When your leaders are around, when the Spirit of God is moving, when people are addressing you on Sunday morning, you're good. But when I walk off, Paul says, I come back and you're so quickly bailed out. Did you really think you can get further that way? That's the question he's saying. How can it be that we can come together and taste of God's goodness, and then immediately you roll back to who you were? That's what he just said. Was that fair? I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings. I'm just trying to show you this is still relevant. Don't tell me what I just said doesn't summarize more than 50% of the so-called giant church we live in America. Don't tell me that's not the case. Because we make church Sundays and Wednesdays. And if you're spiritual, it's Tuesday or Thursday. He said how quickly you could bail and go back to the things you were told to leave. That's why it says, I marvel. I'm amazed that you could just throw it up like that and then dive back in. He says, what is happening? So let's go look carefully now. He says, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth when Jesus Christ was what? Clearly portrayed among you. I mean, you knew and it made sense to you. And then he says, I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun the Spirit, are you made now perfect by the flesh? Let's talk about that. Let's just put verse 3. Let's get this figured out. Verse 3. Where did they begin? The Spirit. I want to tell you something, friends. All of us began the Spirit. Y'all remember John chapter 3? A man named Nicodemus asked Jesus a question. Teacher, we know you're from God because no one can do these miracles that you do. And, John, and Jesus looked at him and said, you must be what? Born again. Born again. He goes, what, can I go back to my mother's womb? He said, are you a teacher in Israel and you don't know that? 
It said, what is born of spirit is spirit. And what is born of flesh or water. He says water in a sense. Flesh is flesh. And so what he's getting at is here. He says, you were all born from the spirit of God. And everything you received from God came from that spirit. But then when you go back to your natural tendencies, your old routines, the way you used to be, you're going back to the flesh. What makes you think that God should save you to begin with? What makes you think that God should deliver us? What makes you think that connected you with the Holy Ghost? What makes you think that got you any further in your relationship with God? To go back to the way you used to be. But if you would just begin and stay in the Spirit, would you not finish the task? Does that make sense what I just said? I said, if you have a tendency to chase God one day a week, and then you go back to the flesh, it is though you've just gone back to quitting. You just threw up your hands and said, I'm not going anywhere. He looked, he says this, are you being made perfect by the flesh? Nothing's happening. Matter of fact, I would say, even in my own commentary, you're making it worse. And what happens with the church is, you know what well, I do, accountability is a word that's kind of out there, but not always applied. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. So basically, we see each other one day a week, and then suddenly you go back to your world, and Paul says, I'm not with you right now. Does it make sense? So for the pastor or the minister or whoever you're going to be in your life, you may see them one day a week or two days a week, and you find out their behavior is like this. You say, man, it's, it's Wednesday. Like, what are you doing? You gave up? Three days into the week, you quit? Did you read your Bible? I didn't read today. You couldn't make it two days without, you know what I'm saying? That's, that's what he's saying. I'm not pointing you out. I'm saying that's the context of what he's saying. How can you just give up? Did being in front of your TV ever get you saved? No. Did you playing video games all night ever get you answered prayer? No. Then why do you go back to that? That's what he's asking. And I don't need to be heavy on you. But he's saying, I'm just quoting the board here. He's saying, look, that's just foolish. He's just saying that's just foolish. I want to transition to the next point here, if you don't mind. Would you mind going with me to Galatians chapter 4? And I'll, I'll try to make a bit more sense so that we can connect and how to get back on the right track. Does everybody see the framework here? So we studied Corinthians and we said division is a huge deal. And Paul said to avoid division is to have the same mindset, the same speech, and no judgment. I hope you all remember that. But now, we, those people in that chapter, if you remember, Paul said, I could not speak to you as mature because you are babes in Christ and I fed you with milk. Do you all remember that? That was core. So we're going to move forward into this situation. How many of you guys know some teenagers? Not a teenager, right? So is a child connected to his father? You can bet. But you know as well as I do in the spirit, or in the flesh, I should say, that when you have teenagers, they begin to say, I don't want to be around the parents. Does it make sense? Do you know the framework? I remember being a teenager. And my, my parents would have people over. I'd run upstairs. But when you're kids, you're told to sit with your parents. Is that true? So in Corinthians, you have a, a church where he says they're babes, I can't help you. But what was Galatians' fault? Clearly they had begun well, and they were growing, and they came to a place where like, do we really need that? Does that make sense? Do we really need him around? Do I really need to pursue him? And because of that, they began to go back to their old ways. As a matter of fact, you guys know teenagers probably make the worst mistakes of their lives. For the most part, unless you're just some kind of criminal mindset, your teenage years are probably the blackest days of your life, as far as mistakes, rebellion, the way you spoke to your parents. And he's saying, look, you guys are kind of falling into that trap. So let me read this very carefully for you. In Galatians chapter 4, verse 1 through. Let me explain that in Scripture. He says this, Now I say that the heir, as long as he a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the Father. Verse 3, even so we, when we were children, were in bondage other, under the elements of the world. Let me explain this. He's saying, you know when you came to the faith, you're considered a child of God. But are you born a man or a woman in the spirit? When you're born again, are you born an adult? Is anybody born an adult in this world? No. No one's born an adult. You're born a baby. And what the problem is, many churches don't understand, you grow in the spirit similar to the way you grow in the flesh. You feed on the Word of God. You're trained by a mentor, trained by an adult. They take care of you until you're of age, and then you step on your own, just like the world. I don't throw my children at the world. They're not ready for that. 
But is my child still recipient of everything I have? That's still true? So read that again. Now I say that my child is a child of God. And my child will have everything I have. But he says it does not differ at all from a slave. Why would he say that? It's because you're under leadership, guarding the steward until the time is appointed where God lets you go into the fullness of your life. Now, that's not me. Okay, you can say Michael just said that. You can deal with it or you don't have to deal with it. I'm trying to help you. What it says specifically is God will take you out and stand you up as a man of God or woman of God when it's what? Appointed by whom? God, Father. Because he's dad. So who am I really this equation or any minister? A guardian, a steward of father's kids. Does it make sense, my role? Does it make sense? Now Paul's talking here. I'm, I inserted myself, but let's talk about Paul. He's saying, guys, you're behaving like teenagers. I think you forgot something. When you didn't know any better, I fed you, I brought you this far. And if you disconnect from me, not only being a teenager, you're really not going to get much further. You're behaving in the flesh. Having begun in the spirit, are you now being made perfect by behaving like that? Acting like you know everything? But if you can remember this, you are a child of God. You have access to everything God gives you. But you're not ready to do that. So God gives ministers. Now that might have hurt someone's feelings, but is that okay? I'm going to give you one more verse to prove it. Because you know what comes after Galatians? Ephesus. And Ephesus gets it. Read chapter 4 of Ephesus 4, 11 through 15. I'm going to just pick apart these verses. Write in your notes. Ephesians chapter 4, 11 through 15. And you know the verse says, And God gave what? Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints. But keep going. Verse 14. Verse 14. That we should no longer be what? Children. Are they your dad? No. But they're there to guide you that you wouldn't be childish. Now we're talking not physical. Is he talking to Sunday school? No, he's saying churches have spiritual ages. And as long as you pretend to say, I don't need a guardian or a steward or a spiritual leadership or a mentor, you're kind of being a teenager. And he says, look, you ain't going to make it. As a matter of fact, you're being childish. Having begun the spirit, these people brought you this far, and then suddenly you go, well, I got it from here. I don't need to check in. I don't need to find anybody. He says, you're going to be made perfect by your own thoughts. Now, am I saying you don't know God? Absolutely not. But it says you will be released when God appoints that time for you. Well, if you say, I want to go to ministry, great. I'm not saying you can't go to ministry. But are you going to go into the warfare with a knife? You get shot down. I found out. It's not that simple. So God, what he does is he puts guardians. Think about it. You think I don't get shot at on account of people? So there's a guardian. There's a wall that God uses. And look, I know better. I'll cover people as much as I can. But then at the same time, if people are out there, let them go. I can't help everybody. But this is the deal. Galatians is a book of a transition from a new believer to that young believer. The guy that says, okay, I understand scripture. I want to minister. I'm beginning to make sense of this. But it's not that you're just thrown out to the wolves. God's asking you to stay in a, in a connection with you. What does that connection look like? Galatians 4.19. We'll go back to Galatians. Galatians 4.19. Galatians 4.19 says this. My little children... For whom I labor and birth again until Christ is formed to you, I would like to be present with you now and to change my tone, for I have doubts about you. Look at those two verses up for a minute. You know what Paul says in Corinthians? Second Corinthians, actually. Though you have 10,000 teachers, you have not many fathers. He says, Man, I'll start over with you if I have to, because I'm worried about you because of the way you're behaving. Does that make sense? Let me recap what I just said, because I'm really worried for you guys. I'm not here to hurt your feelings. How many of y'all remember the wilderness journey from Egypt? Having been birthed in the spirit because of Egypt, a man named Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, come by great power and understanding of God and great training. They go before Pharaoh. They stand up before the devil himself and say, let him go. So he frees his multitude. They come to the wilderness, right? That journey where people start talking back. Y'all know about Moses. How many people argue with him? It says ten times. Moses said, my gosh, you know, guys, just trust me. I'm going to get us there. And you remember the people that followed him? Korah had a rebellion. Aaron even got upset with them. People begin to fight. Did they make it through the promised land? No, not my, my thread with that, no. I'm just saying there's a parallel here. He says, guys, don't make me go back to Corinth with you again. This is the pattern. You have the book of Acts, the picture of the promised land, the fullness of the kingdom. 
You start with Romans. Here's the foundation. This is Deuteronomy, again, for the new believer. You take Corinth. It's like, guys, you're behaving like children. What happened? Do you not remember unity? That's how God started the church. So they grow up, and they begin to unify. They begin to hang out. And they're like, this is great. We're hanging out as friends. The church is really maturing. You know what I mean? And then you go by and say, man, is there anybody here that has wisdom and understanding? Are you guys just leaning on your own flesh to make decisions? You know what happens when teenagers hang out with teenagers? No one's going to tell you you're wrong. Come on. Come on. When I was a teenager, hang out with teenagers. Hey, let's go wrap that guy's house. Everyone's like, that's a skill of 10 o'clock. You think that's stupid? That's exactly what, what kind of lifestyle teenagers have. And you're like, what was I doing? But if somebody were a mature adult with you, and you told an adult, this is what I'm going to do. They look at you, if you're my kid, I might slap you. And I'm like, what did you say? Like, you're joking, right? You mean a video game. Like, today we have video games for that. But like, <laughs> I just say, like, you're doing what? You're not going anywhere. You're staying here with me. My little children, it says in Galatians 4, I will labor again in Jesus because I'm doubting you. I don't think you're growing spiritually. I think the flesh has ruined you. And now I'm changing my tongue to talk to you like this. Does that make sense? Is that making sense for y'all? <clears throat> I hope it is. So he's saying, guys, if you made it this far, good. But how could you do this? I think you've got bad counsel. Galatians 5. Verse 7 through 10. That's going to change my tone. Oh, we're going to from here. Galatians 5, 7 through 10. He says this. You ran well. Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. You're doing great. When you are with guardians, leadership, when you're in church, when you're in small groups and you're chasing Jesus and you're in friends circles that love God, you're doing well. But then he says, who did what? Hinder you. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion does not come from him who calls you. Remember I said you can be in the flesh or you can be in the spirit. A little leaven leavens a whole lump. There's your answer. Verse 9. I just want you to just target that verse. We start with this. Galatians 1. I marvel that you're so quickly turned away from the gospel. Not that there's another gospel. Galatians 3. He says, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you not to obey the truth? And he asks four questions for four verses. It ends with this verse. Guys, what happened? A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I know perfectly good people that got into alcohol in their teenage years because of one man. One young boy that's just stupid. I know perfectly good smart people that were on top of their class that got into marijuana because of one person that said, hey, let's go smoke. I got nothing else to do. I'm young, right? I know perfectly good people that got in terrible relationships said, okay, let's go out. we we'll go to this bar, we'll meet some nice girls. Get some beer in the people, get some alcohol in people, we'll meet some nice girls. Because of one leaven. Do you think leaven affects the church? Yeah. What should it be? The church should affect the leaven. But what's he saying? A little leaven leavens a whole lump. That's sad, right? Because the church is young. When you're in a mature ministry, your goal is called to help people. They won't affect you. You're going to affect them. He's talking to teenagers. Sadly, the same verse in 1 Corinthians 5. In 1 Corinthians 5, remember the babies? He said, a little leaven will ruin this group. He says that. 1 Corinthians 5. He says, leaven will ruin you. A little leaven will leaven the whole lump. He says the same word. He says again, God, guys, here's a mistake. When you just hang out with somebody spiritually younger than you every day, it won't be long till your threshold does this, this, this. I remember a, a manager of mine years ago, many years ago, said, Michael, when you argue with pigs, you know what happens? <laughs> I'm not calling it a pig. But you know, when you argue with pigs, you know what happens? You just get dirty and you realize that people like it. <laughs> Seriously. He said, don't argue with certain people. He was telling me, don't argue with certain people in the workforce. He said, they're looking for a fight. And then you're not going to change their mind. They're just going to get messy with you. They're going to make a big scene. Cuss out. You know what I'm talking about? Just throw their weight around. And he said, you realize they like that kind of stuff. And you're getting sucked into that. So what he's warning you is, and I thank God for him. He's a godly man, actually. Uh, the idea is you have to find people who challenge you. Again, when you're with teenagers in spirit, what's the threshold? Nothing. You, you stay with people that know more. I like, dude, I said, you know, we have a ministry coming along. This. I like that because I get to talk to people who got decades on me. I like to hear from people that have 20 plus years. But anything, I know everything is common. So I meet a man of the spirit. I say, hey, tell me about this. Tell me a story. Tell, you know what I'm saying? You challenge people. So that's my next point for you, friends. To beat this argument that will finish this. 
I have confidence in you and the Lord that you will have no other mind, which is to say, the one mindset is Jesus. We studied that last week. In 1 Corinthians, he said he gave us the one mindset. But he who troubles you shall bear his judgment, whoever he is. What God says is, I know he's a problem, but does that excuse your behavior? Does it say that? Can I say it again? I know who the problem is, but you're not going to have any excuses. You can't say, well, he made me do it. Matter of fact, Adam and Eve tried that, right? Eve, I'm oh, sorry. I hadn't pointed to you. That's terrible, right? She gave me the fruit. Come on, guys. You have to have that memorized when you get married. I'll get that sermon when you get married. All right, guys. Here's the sermon you need. She gave it to me. I'm free. And, of course, he threw them both out. doesn't work. And, of course, the devil starts talking to you. He throws him out. So we don't have the love you excuse. But this is my, my answer for you. We're going to bring it here. We're almost at the end. My point is, what's stopping you from seeking out better solutions? When people come to town on entertaining ministers, do you think he's going to start asking me questions and probing me? Because that's kind of rude, right? Like, he said, oh, so um, what's wrong with your church? Do you think a visiting minister is going to ask me what's wrong with your church? No, I'm going to say that. I'm going to say, hey, tell me about when you were challenged with this, a thought. Tell me when you were challenged by that, and a situation, real, general. Because I don't, I'm very private about people's feelings and their stories of me. <coughs> Excuse me. But at the same time, I want to know. I want to be challenged by people that have experience. And what I find today is that ministers or even the churches today are just very content with what they got. They can't grow. And the growth they're going at is because they decided they know what they know. I'm telling you, friends, you can do that, but it can be just this. You know, ever since I gave the message on acceleration, my whole point is, how do I go faster? I'm almost 40, almost this year. And my thought is, by 40, I should be in the top of my game. I don't want to wait till 100. So my thought is, what can I do to speed the process? And you know how you speed process? Iron sharpens iron. All right. I think we've put some feelings on you guys, and I hope we can end with some pauses. Remember I said at the end, we have the good stuff. So now that we've been through some painful thorn brushes, would you mind reading for me Galatians 5, verse 13 through 15? Galatians 5, verse 13 through 15. It says, for you, brethren, remember he's talking about family, he's not talking about everybody. He's talking about brethren. The family of God have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Let's stop right there. In no, okay, you see, I've dealt with a lot of churches where they really become very militaristic about how they deal with people, and you're literally not like, like a slave or a soldier. I'm not like that. You know me. I'm not really that way. But what I do ask is this. You've been given all the liberty in the world to do what you want every day of the week. But he says, can you not use it to do your own Worldly behaviors. This is what he's saying. He says, can you just use it to serve? Does it make sense? You have all the free time in the world. You're not mean. You're not necessarily running a church. You don't stay up at night doing that. Maybe you do. Good for you if you do. But my point is this. Use your time to serve people. Same thing I do, right? It's not that special. You should serve one another. He's saying with the freedom you have. Because people tell me, okay, so I come to God, what am I do? You tell me I can't have any fun, I can't do anything, I'm stuck here, I can't turn your movies on, I can't play games, I can't do... I didn't say that. He said, you have the liberty to do what you want, but can you just use it to help people? That's what he said. Does that make sense? I get this question from a lot of people. Oh, he's not a Christian, what do I do? I have a book of rules? Actually, no, you don't. Because you love Jesus, you're free, but use that freedom to help people. Verse 14, for all the laws fulfilled in one word, even this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's the same thing he gave to Corinthians. We said the same verse last week. In James 2, he said, Don't show judgment to people. The royal law is, Love your neighbor as yourself. But look at verse 15. Remember what he told Corinthians? Envy, strife, and division has no work of the Holy Ghost. If you buy and devour one another, be west, beware lest you consume by one another. He said those kind of small leavens become big leavens. And the church begins to collapse. Does that make sense? Remember Jesus said, if you're divided, you're going to fall. How do you fall? Because of divisions and envies and strifes and competitions and he did this, they said that. The church will just disappear. They'll just disappear. If you just keep spending your hours chewing at each other, you can bet people will leave. That's all I'm warning. Okay? It's very key. You have to be careful about that. Because for me, unity just means love. It's that simple. Unity just means love. So how does the church of love operate? Maybe we've got young people. Maybe we've got teenagers. Maybe we have babies. That's okay. God will tell us what to do. This is how Galatians ends. 
So he spent all that time saying, guys, let's just knock it off. How do we end this chapter? Galatians 6, 1 through 5 will tell us how to close it up. He says, brethren, again, family, talking to family. If a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are what? Spiritual. spiritual. Talking about spiritual, what you, whether young, old, medium, whatever. Restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Consider yourself lest you make the same dumb mistake. I know I'm mad about translation. He says, guys, we all make mistakes. Don't throw your chest out. Don't say, oh, they're just spiritual kids. They don't know what they're doing. Don't do that. Because, man, if you're so spiritual, lend a hand. Pick up the phone. Love them. Take them to dinner. Hey, do you need a ride? Oh, what's going on? You want to meet for lunch? That's what he's saying. See, what happens is there's a relationship for growing and a relationship for helping. Some of us have one, not the other. Some of us have the other, not the first. Some of us are good at hanging out with friends, and we don't understand what it is to hang with people spiritually strong. Other people hang out with spiritually strong people, but they don't know how to hang out with spiritual friends. Is that okay? Look at the camera, because I don't pick on y'all. Is that what it gets? It says, if you are so godly, if someone messes up, just help them. Is that okay? <clears throat> Verse 2. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Again, the law is not a particular feed him two times a day. Give this much money. Go here. Visit the elderly. Go to the hospital once a week. He just said you have the liberty to do it whenever you want. Do it all you want. But he says you think yourself to be something when he's nothing. He deceives himself. He's saying, like, this is what matters. Does that make sense? What he just said? Let me translate that. Somebody says, well, I'm a doctor. I'm a lawyer. I'm an engineer. So what? I serve Jesus by spending my time helping people. You're something. Does it make sense? The world will tell you. Teenagers love to tell you what they got, what they own, how much they have, collections, how fast they are. He says, that's not the thing. That's, I'm not saying you can't have nice stuff. I'm just saying what matters is if you will just do what? Fulfill the law of Jesus. Spend your time helping people. All right. Let me give you the revelation of how all this works. Is that okay? Remember what happens in the last book, Corinthians? If you would be willing to to follow Jesus and the understanding that God gave us last week, I said Jesus is the remember, Jesus is the foundation. foundation. You are the Wall. walls. Then what should come inside? We are the temple of the Holy Spirit, as a matter of fact. We were designed to receive the Holy Ghost. Is everybody okay with that? You were designed to receive the Holy Spirit. Okay? One more time? You want to say it out loud? I am designed to receive the Holy Spirit. I am the building of God. I am designed to receive the Holy Spirit. I'm the temple of God. I remember that. Read for me. Here's Revelation. Galatians 3, verse 5 and 6. See, these things don't work. You read, oh, I want this, I want that. You have to follow the rules, friends. It's like playing a game. Therefore, he will supply the Spirit. What did you say? I must be what? Filled with the Spirit. What did you just say? I am designed to be filled with the Holy Ghost. He who does that, he who supplies the Spirit and then does what? Works miracles. See, this church is designed for miracles. You either heard me or you didn't. This church is designed for miracles. But if I've got shabby walls and a ceiling that's leaking water and lights that don't work, we're not going to get very far. So I'm doing this to help this church, not pick on people. I said last week, if you the foundation is one mindset, one speech, one judgment, which is Jesus. We're the church in one unity. The Spirit of God comes. And that God who provides the Spirit of God will work miracles among you. How does he do it? By the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? See, clicks don't make miracles happen. It's unity that makes miracles happen. But people are, oh, I know ministers that have all kinds of power. They're not the book of Acts. That's not Acts. Acts was a supernatural church that created several powerhouses. Not just the twelve. There were also deacons. There were men like Stephen and full of faith. Remember that Philip? These guys were powerhouses. They weren't just a group of small people. And we didn't get to read about the rest of them. So he says, guys, if you want to be like that, just remember, it's the Spirit of God that brought you this far, and the Spirit of God that will bring you into it. We don't have to start playing games with each other, saying, I'm this, I'm that. How does he explain it? Just as Abraham believed God and has accounted him for righteousness. What got you saved? Well, how do you get saved? Does it work? It's faith. It's faith. <clears throat> What's going to continue your work in the Holy Ghost? Faith. Works? Faith. faith. What's going to create miracles in your life? Works? Faith. faith. 
Now, what is the foundation of that faith? It's a lifestyle that serves God. Does that make sense? Because any of the lifestyle will be very young. It will be very fleshly. You won't get very far. Remember what I said last week? Your character determines your spiritual power. Do you remember that? you know where I got that from? I said, I cannot speak to you as mature words because you're a babe, so I gave you milk. So a spiritually young person can't receive the fullness of God's power. So, but how do I receive the fullness? How do I see miracles in my life? My character has a direct influence. You know what Galatians 5 is known for? Galatians 5, you know what it's known for? The fruit of the Spirit. Thank you. Those, the same the Holy Ghost. The same Holy Ghost that works miracles is the one that gives you the fruit of the Spirit. Does that make sense? I've got one point in the word 12, 15. Would you just write in your homework? Galatians 4, 22 through 28. Galatians 4, 22 through 28. And y'all stand up. I want to show you how to live a miraculous lifestyle. I know this was a heavy-handed message. I'm not joyous and doing backflips to, to throw things like this. But I want to just write down that, and I want to show you how to see miracles become a lifestyle. Y'all remember my van story? That wasn't the only one, okay? Just trust me. I'm not a guy that comes and waves a flag at what I can do. But I'm just telling you, how do you get there? It's very simple. Galatians 4, 22 through 28. I just want to give you a summary. Please read it because a lot of verses for me to finish with this. I'm hoping that I still have your minds engaged. I will be checked out. Paul gives a story saying, guys, I'm going to give you two references about living as a teenager who thinks he knows everything, about people who hold on to Jesus. He said, do you not remember about Abraham had two wives? Hagar and Sarah. He said, this is a typecast of kinds of people. There are people who want to do things their way. What did Sarah do? Take Hagar in, take the plans of God in your own hands, right? Do it your way. Will you get a child? Yes. Is that really called the child of promise? No. He said, what is the child of promise? He said, those who have faith, those who believe God. Now read this. Verse 25, for this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. Remember I said that earlier? If you're in the flesh, you're still in bondage. Now let's keep going here in the spirit. But the Jerusalem, verse 26, but the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of all. Very interesting about this family, right? Church is your family. It's what brought you so far. For it is written, now here's the miracle. I want you to catch it. I'm going to explain for it is written, Rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. Now to verse 28. Who are you? You're the child of promise. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. Now roll back to 27. We're going to go pray with this. I'm going to break it down. really work for you. I want to make sure you got this. If you do things the world's way, Will you get what you want? According to Hagar, did she get a child? Yes. She got Ishmael, but she got one named Ishmael. And that's about it. It says if you do things God's way, you'll celebrate because you have what? The nation of Israel. You can stick to your plans, and you can achieve a very small world, okay? That's how I was living. Just trust me, friend. you like, okay, I just want a house, I just want a family, I want a job, I'm good. I got that. I was doing my worldly thing. I don't think everybody in the world is just evil and criminal. They just want to have a house, you know, they just want to blow the yard on the weekend, they just want to go to the store. That's what they'll get. One thing. But if you come to Jesus, you will have an unlimited potential. You may be barren now, but it says you will have more than you ever asked for. Amen. Does it make sense? I'm saying this may be a hard road now. And many people stop right here and say, this is as far as I go, I'm going to go back to the world. Let me go back to the way I did things. That was, it was just easier. I had more control of my life. But if you were willing to believe God in the fullness of His plan, He says you'll rejoice. Does that make sense? All I can say humbly is this. You ever thought my 20s and my teenager that I'd be standing here? No. I just trusted God at the end. I don't know the exact final plan for each of you. But God does. But if you hold fast to God, you will see every drop of it. You'll see every drop. But you know as I do. What did Paul say? How soon you return back to the way you were. You'll get what you want. But you'll stop here. My goal for this church is that you would see everything. Everything full that God ever promised you. Is that okay? So, if you don't mind, let's go into prayer.